Today we're going to try some code for analysis of bisulfite sequencing data. In the first module, we'll read in some already aligned reduced representation bisulfite sequencing, or RRBS, data. We will inspect the data and perform some basic quality control on it. In the second module, we will try several approaches to analyze the RRBS data, and with the goal of identifying loci and regions that are differentially methylated between mouse oocytes and zygotes. In the third module, we will read in some already processed whole genome bisulfite sequencing, or BSSeq, data, and we'll use the bs-smooth function from the bs-seq package and the dml test and dmr finder functions from the dss package to identify differentially methylated regions in colon cancer. Our first step will be to load the required packages, which we've already installed. So we've got dss, bs-seq, and then we have an example data set from the bs-seq package called bs-seq data, and this will get used in the third module. So I'll just run these three lines, the library command to pull in the two required packages and the data we're going to be using. And we'll then begin our first example, which is going to be analysis of two replicates each of mouse oocyte and mouse zygote. Um, it, and these are reduced representation data that were made available through a, um, a Nature publication from 2012 um, by Smith et al. So our first step will be to read the data in from the text files. So the first command, we're going to use the read table command to read in uh, this file that we already have over here um, called oocyte rep onetxt And it's, it's, this is the first replicate of the oocyte data. We, we're going to have two. So I'll, I'll go ahead and run this, and then we can inspect the data. So we've defined this object called o1, which is the, the table of data. We can use the head command, which will just print out the first few lines of it just to see what it looks like. And we can see it looks like it has four columns. We have our chromosome, we have position, we have um, capital N, which is the number of reads per position. Um, we have X, which is the number of methylated reads per position. And we might want to know a little bit more than that about the data. We might want to know how big it is, how many rows there are, because each, each row corresponds to one position along the chromosome. So how many positions are we looking at? The, and each position is a CPG site. So if we use the we can use the dim function. It, this is a, basically a matrix, so we can ask the dimension of this matrix. So we've got fifteen thousand one hundred and eighty rows and the four columns, and so that suggests there are fifteen thousand one hundred and eighty CPG positions. And even though th this is reduced representation by sulfide sequencing data, so we're certainly not getting all the CPGs in the genome. But even so, this seems a little bit small. It's probably not the entire genome. Um, and we might notice the first column is chromosomes. So let's do a table of that to see if we have all the chromosomes or just some of them. So I'm doing a one dollar sign chromosome. That refers to the column named chromosome. Um, for those who don't use R a lot, another way to do this would have been to just ask for the first column. So O1, and then this um, subsets the matrix. We're taking just the first column of the matrix. And so both of these gave us the same answer. It looks like all 15,180 rows are from chromosome 18. And so that's why this data set is so small. It's just chromosome 18, and it's reduced representation data. Um, and this is nice because, first example, it's a small, very manageable data set to play around with. So that was just the first sample. We have three more samples that we can read in. We have the second oocyte replicate, which is here. I can run the line, run line 22 to read it in. And then we have two zygote replicates, and I'm going to read those in as well, and I'll name them Z1 and Z2. Okay, and so now we can, um, we can use the ls command, which will list all of the objects in our environment. And as you might expect, we now have four objects in the environment, the, the data from each of the two oocytes and the two zygotes. We can also check out the other data sets we've read in to see if they're similar to the first one. We would kind of hope so, and they do seem to have the same dimension. Um, we can we can use the head command to just see. they have they have the same format. Um, it's even we can even check whether they're sorted in the same order. And this probably won't matter for our analysis, but it matters for some analyses. So it's a good thing to check. Um, so to do that, we would check whether the second column is the same. And in R, you always use the double equal sign to ask the question: Is this equals? Is is this equal to something? So we could check whether the second oocyte is sorted in the same order as the first oocyte. And and I did this wrong because I don't have I don't have an object called O, so I typed to this totally wrong. We will do this again. And th and this is what's great about programming: you can make mistakes and they're recoverable. So what I want to ask is: is the second column of O1 the same as the second column of O2 in every instance? And 
right parentheses, and it, it, the table only has one entry, true. And so what that means is that the question I asked, are these two equal, is true for every single row of the matrices O1 and O2. And we could do this again for all of the, all of the data. If we wanted to, we could just check it. So we could, we could say, is O1 have the same sort order as Z2? It does. And we could do it Z1. And this is a little bit ad hoc. It's not in the code. But these are additional things I like to do when reading in new data sets. You always like to check it out and make sure that the data are as expected. So we've done that. We are pretty familiar now with what our data look like. And so now we'd like to perform some basic manipulation on it so we can do quality control. And so the first thing we're going to do is try to calculate the, the coverage in terms of read, number of reads for each of the, of the sites. We're going to do the average coverage across the four samples. That's, that's our goal that we would like to get to. We will also compute um, the count of methylated reads for each of the four samples. And first we're going to create matrices that are that include this information for all four samples. And so we're going to use the CBind command to kind of mash this information together. And so I mentioned that if you do dollar sign $n, that takes the column named n. And so we're going to take the n column from each of these four objects and use CBind to concatenate it together. And so CBind stands for column bind. It will concatenate the columns together from right to left. There's also an R bind, which would concatenate rows together, but we're not going to use that here. And so um, we're creating this object called n covered which is the coverage for each of the four samples. We can run it. So we can type head and covered. And so it's just giving us the, it, it's put together the coverage for each of the four samples. There are no labels in this matrix, but this is just an intermediate matrix we're going to use to compute some other things. So we won't worry about that for now. We can run the same command for the methylated read counts. And so this, this is, um, you might remember that this was X. This was the column named X. And so we can inspect that as well. And so these lo this looks like the first matrix, but the numbers are smaller because these are the counts that are methylated. There are also unmethylated counts that are not included here. Um, we can also check the dimension of it. It should have the same dimension. It should have the same number of rows as the original data did, 15,180, and it does. And so we've created these two matrices that we're now going to use to compute the average coverage and the average methylation proportion. Um, we'll compute average coverage first. For those who are new to R, this apply function is really great. It will take any function. Here we're going to use the mean function, and it, will, and it will apply it to a whole matrix, either to all the rows or to all the columns. And so here we have the name of the matrix we're applying it to. Here we have the function. And then we have a number one in the second argument. And the one says that we would like to apply this to each row separately. So for all 15,180 rows, we will get one number. And that will be the average uh, of the coverage across the four rows. So we'll get the average number of reads for each of the CPG sites in our data once we run this. And so we'll go ahead and run it. And we can inspect it too. Because it's taking one entry for each of the 15,180 rows, we would expect it to be a vector of length 15,180. And it looks like it is. We can also check out the first few entries just to see what it looks like. And so we can use the subscripting here. And here we have a vector, not a matrix. So we don't need a comma. We just have one dimension. You'll see that the read counts look pretty high. This is because we have reduced representation by sulfite um, sequencing data here. By narrowing our focus to just the CPG-rich regions of the genome that we care about the most, we have given ourselves the ability to get very deep coverage of, these, of just these regions. And so this is a little bit deeper than what we'll see when we get the whole genome by sulfite sequencing data. OK, so that's the average coverage. We're now going to calculate the average methylation proportion for each CPG site. And we're going to do that by dividing the number of methylated reads by the number of covered reads for each individual. And then we will use the apply function again to compute the mean for each CPG site. And so we'll just run this line of code. And now we have an object called average meth. It's going to also be a vector of length 15,180. And we can use we can look at we can look at the first um, ten entries or so. I will just subset it here. Okay, and so these definitely look like methylation proportions. They're all between they're, they should all be between zero and one. We can look at the minimum of this just to make sure. And yeah, they go they go between zero and one. We can also use the hist function to make a histogram of that. That would be a nice way to represent the data. There it is. 
And this this looks a little bit like what we would expect. For those who've seen methylation data before, you know that if you look at if you look at say array data, you which which covers the whole genome pretty well, you will usually see a peak near the bottom because there's a lot of unmethylated sites, and then you see a lot of fully methylated sites near the other end. Here we're actually seeing a lot of sites with no meth with no methylation at all, and then a lot of hemimethylated sites. And this may be because we're actually comparing oocytes to zygotes, and so we have two very distinct groups of cells. And so these may actually be the average between unmethylated and fully methylated samples for each CPG site. But that gives us an idea of what the data might look like. Okay, so we're next going to perform some very basic QC. Here we've decided we're going to um, keep the average coverage within reasonable bounds. We are suspicious of CPG sites that have exceedingly high coverage, more than 300 reads at a single CPG site, for example. That probably indicates an artifact such as um, non-unique mapping. Perhaps there's a non-unique mapping situation where all the reads are mapping to one portion of the genome or other artifactual reasons. We're going to filter these out. We are also going to filter out the CPGs with very, very low average coverage. Um, the, the approaches we're going to use are actually good about handling low coverage data. They, they, will, they will specifically, some of them will specifically model the number of reads for, for a CPG site and sample. But when all the samples have very low, very low coverage, those are going to get filtered out in our QC. We're also going to, because we're going to perform differential methylated analysis, we don't care about CPG sites that show no variations. If all of the methylation is zero for everybody, or all the methylation is one for everybody, the, there would be nothing to find. There would be no differential methylation. So we're going to filter those out as well. We're, we're defining an object called keep. Keep is going to be a true false. It's, a vec it's going to be a vector of trues and falses that indicate whether for each CPG site are all these statements true, or is it false to say that all this is true. And so we'll, um, we'll create the, the keep object, and then we can inspect it a little bit. And so we've created keep. We can, this will probably be another long vector. It's, it is. We can, we can inspect the first 10 elements of it. They're all true. We could also, because it's a true-false vector, we could also tabulate it. And so here we can see that it, the, the statement above is true for 12, about 12,000 of the 15,000 CBG sites and false for over 3,000 of them. So we're going to perform QC that will remove those 3,000. And we'll do this. This is actually, th this syntax isn't something I usually recommend. I don't recommend over overwriting an object with another object of the same name. That's kind of a bad idea, but here we're doing it. Um, and it's going to work out. So we're subset, we're using this true false vector. The reason we created it is so we could subset. This, this statement is going to take the O1 matrix and only for the elements where keep is true, it's going to take those rows only, and it's going to create a new version of O1 that's of lower dimension than the old version. And one of the reasons we probably shouldn't have done this is because then we could, if we hadn't, we could compare the two objects. But we're going to, we're going to forge ahead. So we've, com we've created four new objects, and they're going to have the idea is that they should be like the original data objects we read in, but they're going to have fewer rows. And if you look at, you can look at the dimension of all of them if you want to. They all have just 12,045 rows. And these are all the, these are based on all the CPGs where keep was true because all of the QC criteria were passed. We can also look to see if, to see which CPG sites got filtered out for which reasons. We can see how many had um, low average coverage. So it looks like 587 of them were removed for having coverage less than five. 63 of them are removed for having really high coverage, too many reads, over 300 reads mapping to one site. And then we're going to remove, we removed some for being invariant. So there were actually almost 2,600 that had no methylation at all. And thus, we're not interested in a differential methylation analysis. And there were 43 that had, that were every, everyone was fully methylated. And so that's what was filtered out. So we're still left with about 12,000 CPG sites that we can analyze. And in the next module, we will take you through some basic analysis of it. We've QC'd O1, O2, Z1, and Z2. We're going to convert these into a BSSeq data object. We're going to call it QC data because this is our post QC data. But it's going to be a BSSeq data object. This, this is the format that's preferred by both of the packages we're going to run. Um, both BSSeq and DSS can use this kind of object. And so to do that, we'll give it a list of the, the four elements. We'll We'll tell it what we want each sample to be named so that these labels will kind of follow us through our analysis. And so I'll run this. And so now we've got this object called QC data. 
we can inspect it. We could actually just type it, type in its name, and it will actually tell this, tell us this about the object. And anytime you have a BS Seek object, if you just ask to look at it, instead of printing out all the data, it will give you just this information. It will tell you that, tell you the type of object it is. It's a BS Seek object. It will tell you how many methylation loci, and it says methylation loci rather than CPG sites because you often have methylation loci that are not CPG sites. Sometimes you'll have CHH or CHG sites as well. So we have 12,000 methylation loci, and then we have four samples. And it tells you whether or not it's been smoothed, because one of the elements of the BSSeq package is be smooth, and so the data will often be smoothed. And in the next module, we are going to actually smooth the data ourselves using be smooth. And then we can also use the G ranges to just see um, what, th this is a way of summarizing what parts of the genome are covered by these data. So we can run G ranges on this BSSeq object, and it tells us what we kind of knew, that everything's from chromosome 18, and it looks like the range covers most of the chromosomes. So we have our RBS data from all across chromosome 18, as we thought. And that's the end, end of module 1. I will see you all again in module 2.